takes a lot of people to do the work that we do. It's not just one person. Um, we've got a great team. I am really just a figurehead. Um, throughout the years, I've had a lot of help. Uh, I've had a lot of support, and uh, this award is not just for me. I'm just the one lucky enough here tonight to, to receive it. But uh, among those that I'd like to thank are my employers throughout time. Uh, originally, Aldo Body, whose firm I worked with in Oak Brook, took this case on appeal. And after the appeals were done, um, I happened to get in touch with some doctors to lead me onto the theory that attacked the, uh, the, the basis that attacked this theory. And uh, he allowed me to continue working on this case, uh, even though it was on a pro bono basis. And once I left his office, he was generous enough to let me take it and continue with the fight. I'd like to thank my wife, Chris, who allowed me to spend a lot of my free time and time that uh, I would normally spend with her and the family uh, because she believes in Pam's case and she believes in this as well. Uh, she's as much to thank for the efforts as, as I am. My paralegals and assistants throughout the year, years have given me a, a tremendous amount of support. Uh, most recently, my, who Erica knows well, my, my assistant Christina Walker uh, back at our office has, has done a tremendous amount of work for me and the, in addition to the two other partners she works for to, to help with this case, um, including weekends and nights, I know. Um, the many law students from the project here who have worked on the case throughout the year did a fantastic job. Whenever I needed some of the difficult work of summarizing medical records, summarizing past appellate records, arguments, they did a fantastic job. And I can't be grateful enough for saving me uh, a tremendous amount of time and giving me an absolutely professional quality product. My friend who's here tonight, Mark Rapino, uh, is an attorney that I've done a, a lot of cases with throughout the years. Um, and he, uh, throughout the dark times and low points of this case, uh, continued to talk me through it and, and, and get me up and, and have me keep going on it. Uh, my current firm, which, which took me in knowing that I'd be spending a lot of time on this case uh, in supporting that decision, our experts that we had on this case, thanks to the Innocence Project. Years ago, in November of 2009, I received a second reversal from the Second District of Appellate Court on the post-conviction case here. And it was after the Audrey Emmons case um, where certain leading doctors like Pat Barnes in California, I believe Pat Lance as well, uh, John Plunkett, all testified and really was substantial in a, in a movement that really took this theory apart. Um, and I got this reversal from the second district sending the case back uh, for, for, for post-conviction. At the time, I was a solo practitioner. And I see all of these world-renowned doctors on this affidavit. It was, it was the roadmap on how to attack, attack this. And the first thing that came into my mind was, great, what do I do now? Is Pat Barnes going to pick up the phone for me? Is, uh, you know, John Plunkett going to, now that I know him, they would have, but uh, back then I didn't realize that. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm here on a, on a claim of ineffective assistance account, counsel, and now the, the appellate court has given me the opportunity to be ineffective at the, uh, at the evidentiary hearing that they just ordered. Um, and I got in touch with the Innocence Project, and they did a fantastic job putting me in contact with these leading doctors who spent countless hours uh, informing me, each addressing their specialties as they relate to this particular theory. And very briefly, the, some of these experts, Chris Van E, Dr. Pat Barnes, Dr. John Plunkett, Dr. Pat Lance, Attorney Heather Kirkwood in Seattle, uh, and in particular, Dr. Shaku Tease, who spent a lot of time with me, uh, educating me as to this theory, and uh, especially Dr. Peter Speth, who was with me in the beginning of this. And really, if anybody is responsible for my level of understanding this theory, it's, it's him, he spent countless hours and nights, and they, they weren't always pleasant conversations, but they were very, very productive, and he was one of the people that kept me going. Last and not least to thank is the Innocence Project themselves. As I said, I got the, the, the remand for this hearing we had in September, 
uh, with no resources, no contacts, is to do what the appellate court told me to do. So I thank them. Finally, the reason why you do this, and the reason why you do this as an attorney is because it's the right thing. We have a rare opportunity to fix wrongs. This is truly a family's effort, you know, and I'm talking about everybody plays a part. I was speaking at the University of Illinois last week, and a young man told me, he said, um, well, I don't really do much work on the Innocent Project case. I just do research. I say, what you mean you just do research? You know, um, that's important. Research is important. So it's a team effort. Everybody plays their part. So if you're just doing research, this person doing this, this person doing this, this person doing this, then it's all combined in that pot to prove this person innocent. So don't just say you're just doing research. You're doing what the team needs you to do, that there are injustices in our system. And it's some that may never get to be proven as innocent. But we have to do our part. And these people that's doing the footwork, like Mr. Zorn spoke on, Mr. Zorn again, like I told that young man last week, he said he just do research. You say what you do don't matter, but it does. It does matter. It matters a lot because a lot of people don't get to hear the John Hannons, the Larry Golden, the Rhonda Keeches. So with you putting the truth out there makes a big difference because a lot of people do read the newspaper. So it does matter. You know, everybody had to, everybody had to play their part in doing this here. If, if it's something as small as you think, you may think it's something small, but I know it means a lot. You know, Juan know it means a lot. Keith know it means a lot. You know, because there's so many people that need you all help. And backing these innocent projects, supporting these innocent projects, if I can do anything to help the next person, I'm willing to do that because I sat in them cells over 14 years. I know how I feel to sit in a cell for numerous years and say, why am I here? I'm innocent, I didn't do this. It's another young man or a young woman that's sitting in the cell saying the same thing right now. So we need the Steve Beckers in the world. That man is doing tremendous work. We need people like that and they need you all support. You know, so don't be ashamed to step up and say, hey, what can I do? How can I contribute? What can I, what can I do for the cause? Because the cause is very much needed and these programs need people behind them. First of all, as she stated, my name is Juan Rivera. I was wrongly convicted of a rape murder of an 11 year old child. I serve almost 20 years of my life. That's half of my life. I am 40 now. I was 19 years old when I first was introduced to the Illinois Department of Correction. Uh, as an inmate, going to prison for a crime that he did not commit, specifically of an 11-year-old child, I can honestly tell you that my life was a horror flick. It was a movie that some of us will understand and many of you will never understand. I got stabbed twice because of this case. Uh, my IQ and my English was very poor, uh, thanks to many students of the Northwestern College University, Stanford, uh, Francis Parker, which is an elementary school, they helped me to get my education by sending me books, uh, historical books, religious books, legal books, of course, so I could learn about the law. But it took the courageous effort of the community, members, friends, news media, to take a stand in helping an individual that they felt was innocent. Uh, my time in prison was very difficult. I attempted to communicate with many different organizations. Of course, DNA exoneration at that time was very difficult because it was a new science that was presented. Uh, today I have my first appellate defender, which is Tim Gaberson. He is a man that has taught me many things in life. He never gave up on me. He fought for me even with his family. That means his vacation was my case. These are individuals that I trust with my life, I love dearly. Today I am here because I was invited, even though Springfield University did not help me come home. But you did help me come home because you are doing it with others. That is my life. There is two individuals here that I have never met in my life. Still yet, I know their life. I share with them. 
And to be here and share with you my story is important because not everybody is in prison, it's a lost cause. At the moment, I am working at Center for Comparative Medicine, which is in the medical science field at Northwestern. I will be entering college as an undergrad for business management. All this was because of you, because you never gave up on me. And I tell you today that I will not give up on you. I will speak for the innocent. I will help those that have made mistakes in their life. They deserve another chance. I will someday hopefully open a restaurant so I can help those that are parolees or exonerated so they can learn their way in the kitchen as I have. Uh, they will have a job training and of course the community is very helpful in this because they are also supporting me. So today I'm here just to thank you for all your support, all your help and all the dedicated work that you give us every single day. Well, I didn't meet Santiago until after he was convicted. Uh, a friend of mine who happened to be the translator for the defense um, was, at my, um, was at my house right after the jury reached its verdict. And uh, when she described uh, how he let out this blood-curdling scream, soy innocente, um, you know, I, oh, how, I couldn't imagine. And she had felt that he was innocent. and. Um, imagine being without friends or family. Um, so I s said if there's anything I could do please let me know because the jail was right near our house. And so she called up two weeks later and asked me to teach Santiago English in the Clackamas County Jail before they sent him down to, to OSCI in Salem. And it was only supposed to be for a couple weeks but it ended up being six weeks and I went in every day um, four or five hours. and. I gained his trust and we bonded and I realized after hearing his story that there was something wrong and uh, I didn't want to base my my feeling, just base my assessment only on my feelings so um, you know I talked to a lawyer, I had one of my former um, um, students do an investigation of all the camps and and even the police, um, got the police tapes and everything. Um, and um, I just felt if he's innocent, you know, you've got to right a wrong. And I was very naive and didn't real. Somebody told me, well, it's almost impossible to reverse a murder conviction, but I, I chose <laughs> not to believe that. And. Um, and I also realized that how difficult it would be to win in court. So um, uh, I decided to, um, to prepare the case also for a commutation. And in order to get a commutation, you have to show the governor that you have a lot of community support. And without that, um, you know, the community could rise up and, you know, uh, object to it. So um, I made sure that um, I did get the community support and how I did that was to work with the media and can't, Santiago's case was extremely unique. Um, there were so many issues of injustice and, and that it really lent itself to community organizing. There were issues of racism, of the whole migrant worker situation, language, culture, um, poverty and um, prosecutorial abuse and so there were a lot of issues that people could identify with. The other thing that I knew when I started organizing um, Santiago's case uh, is that I'd have to find the best legal resources possible and I, so he had the best of the legal services which was critical and um, but so like, so you have to understand, so I was looking in two directions at once, you know, preparing, organizing a committee to educate the community and to gain support and resources so that I could take it to the governor, collect petitions, and then at the same time do everything we, we could to uh, win his um, post-conviction relief. We did end up meeting with the, with the governor, and so the governor, um, agreed that if the prosecutor, if the Attorney General would retry Santiago, then he would step in and pardon him. And so they did not um, retry him uh, because of that. 
Uh, well, I, I don't think of it as a sacrifice. I think of it as the most incredible learning experience of my life. Um, I just, um, I think it's, um, it's a human response to, to try to right a wrong. And so when I w became aware of his situation, I just couldn't imagine walking away. And um, um, it, it was a life-changing experience for both of us. Before we were filing the, the papers for post-conviction relief, uh, I held a press conference and I wanted to be able to tell the media and, uh, that he had, Santiago had a lot of support from the community. And so I thought, well, one way to do it is to call up the University of Portland and see if they would be willing to give Santiago a scholarship when he's free. So uh, I got on the phone, I was scared, you know, and, and talked to Father Odo. and. And without a moment's hesitation, I asked him if he would be willing to, if he would consider giving Santiago a scholarship when he was free and, and if I could tell the media. And without a moment's hesitation, he said, well, of course, yes, and, and you can tell them the media were working on it. They were really wonderful to, I mean, really, that, that was a, really a life-changing experience also, not just his freedom, but having the opportunity to get an education because when I was teaching him English, I mean, he was just amazing. He was like a sponge. You know, he had such a thirst for education and, uh, you know, I realized he was very special. And um, so, I, like I said, I feel very, very fortunate. I'm so grateful to all the support that I got and the, the responsiveness of the community. Um, uh, yeah, there were so many people who made a difference, and you know, like people from all walks of life. Um, one of the, you know, there's so many bittersweet experiences, but like I remember um, in trying to get, show the community that we had support, uh, I went out to the migrant camps and asked for donations, and you have no idea how difficult that was. You know, here asking dirt, dirt poor people to chip in, and I looked in the basket, and there were five dollar bills, fifty dollar bills, mm -hmm. and it was. Do you know the story of the widow's mite? You know the uh, it's a, a parable of the, the the widow who was. Um, oh, first of all. Uh, um, um, a very rich man, you know, made it, helped somebody and, you know, gave a lot. Or, and then there was um, a very poor woman who just dropped up one coin and, and then uh, the, the lesson is she gave up her all. It was small, but she gave everything. So, um, um, yeah. Illinois Department of Corrections. I do a reentry program called Community Support and Advisory Council. And uh, in this, with this, uh, I get a chance. You know, I work inside the prisons and out. I do parole staffings. I make sure guys got everything they need to stay on the right on the right page. And uh, today, you know, I was with like 15 guys. Every Wednesday, I'm with like 40, maybe 45 guys in my groups. And I do a group where I cut their hair and. We talk about issues, we talk about how to overcome barriers that hold us back, uh, how to deal with people, what if a police did address you wrong, how do you handle it? We talk about how not to go back to the penitentiary. That's what we talk about, and we try to make a difference with that. So that's what this program has, has given me an opportunity to do. You know, I work for Howard area on, 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 in Rogers Park, which is now becoming a real high crime area. You know, and uh, it's really, you know, it's important that we have something like this in place because the guys that don't want to be a part of the gangs and stuff, they relate to me. They come see me, they talk to me, you know, and for the most part, we help them find jobs, get in school. I see guys every morning taking their sons and stuff to school, then they go off to work. That's what we're looking to do. So, yeah. Uh, 
you know, every, every little something counts. You know, we try to make a, a big difference with every small thing. I knew a lot of people. And uh, we help a lot of guys uh, uh, with employment, housing, uh, clothes, uh, whatever they need. You know, we meet them right where they are. And we, that's, those are the things that work. I have a lot of attorneys who donate clothes, suits, uh, some clothes with tags and Brooks Brothers and stuff, you know. So I have a lot of attorneys and a lot of the, uh, the, uh, the big shots in IDOC donate me suits and shoes and stuff like that. Unfortunately, that's another piece that we have to focus on. For those individuals who, whose families have moved on, who may have passed on, who they may not have, you know, again, on the back end, what can we do to be surrogates to them to help them get to that place? Because it's one thing to say, here, you can have access to some funds, but are, am I comfortable with having access to that? Do I understand what I, what's available to me? Who's going to help guide me through that? So for me, I was on the phone with the Social Security Administration office. I was on the phone with uh, going to the motor vehicle, getting his ID, getting the paperwork and so forth. I was writing the documentation for him and saying, here's what it's saying, here's what would happen to So it's that kind of thing. And it's not to say that he's not doing anything, he's doing a great deal for himself. But I'm flying high cover and to make sure that we, we don't have too many things fall through the crack. I call it a movement, the Innocence Project movement, is that I would say that they do an outstanding job on the intake in terms of identifying the cases and trying to take as many as they can. They have extraordinary talent in terms of the legal uh, intellectual capital that they use to, to uh, uh, vindicate their, their clients. But I think that on the back end, as opposed to getting to a place where you say, okay, we no longer represent you as your legal counsel, that there's another opportunity to starburst this uh, professional services. And that is, in my mind, that you have a more of a holistic approach to that individual. So you, you have a structured approach in terms of uh, job skills, uh, academic pursuit, uh, seeing if there's opportunities for uh, universities to offer scholarships for folks to go to school, and you sort of hold their hand through that whole process. Think about the burgeoning crop of technology and how it has changed in over 20 years. Your laptop can be outdated in one year, okay? When my brother was incarcerated, uh, cell phones were like big uh, army walkie-talkies, you know? <laughs> you know like, so when you think about all that a person has missed when they were incarcerated, I think the great opportunity to starburst that capability is doing on the back end and say holistically, we're not only going to vindicate you, but we're going to take it another step forward. As a nonprofit, we're going to offer you job skills. We're going to say that we have scholarships that we can uh, solicit uh, uh, academic institutions as an opportunity to say you could go get, pursue your education. You can go get your GED. Uh, you can help them in terms of their presentation skills, their platform skills, be able to articulate and communicate what happened to them. Get them uh, uh, the, the social services, which I believe are in place in some inst most instances, but make sure there's a way of identifying if there's some, some uh, post-traumatic stress uh, going on as it relates to what, what they encountered. Asking questions, sharing the stories, um, spending some of your time doing something about it, caring. I mean, I think we are shaped and fashioned by what we love, Ghost says. When you give some of your time and attention to something, you know, that's, things catch on. Um, it's contagious. If you care about something, then people who know you will begin to pay attention to it, and it spreads. Um, finding out, you know, what you can do, um, it can be small, it can be big, letting other people know that, you know, I know when they were raising money for my bond, um, I come from a humble family. We don't have money, and we have even less of it now. Um, my folks' retirement was gone, and so they had to raise big money for my bonds, or what was big to us, like $75,000. It was a lot to people that don't have a lot. And there were people, some people who gave 10000 or some people who gave a dollar, and the dollar was just as important as the 10000 and people don't realize that, but it's true. And letting people know that, I mean, if you can give a dollar, give a dollar. And tell people thank you for that dollar. And let people know that it takes every person, the ones that can give a dollar and the ones that can give $10,000. And it takes people who are willing to walk around and tell the story or sign the petition or, you know, help build the website or whatever it takes. And it's individual stories and finding out about them. Well, it, it's been a great learning tool for our law students because 
we could work on just about anything. For example, if an exoneree says, yeah, I've gotten some certificate of innocence money, I'd like to buy a house, we'll get local counsel at a local law firm like Hinshaw and Culbertson or Bierman Swordlove and we'll say, could you help us out? Then the law students and the exoneree get to work with an established real estate attorney. The law students learn, we all learn, and we've gotten good counsel for them and it's pro bono. So we'll do that sort of thing too. So family law, we'd go out to someone else. So essentially it's, you know, my law students and I talk about it and it's essentially like running a, um, like a small law firm. My name is Kiran Desai and I'm a volunteer with the Illinois Innocence Project in, in Springfield, Illinois. I came to know about the uh, Illinois Innocence Project is when I read in a local newspaper that we had an individual named Jonathan Moore, Navis Grayson, who was exonerated and he was in a Springfield and I read about him and uh, it was kind of surprised me that a 19 year old kid could get convicted wrongfully and spend a couple of years in jail. So I attended a Innocence uh, Project meeting and I met him and that is what made me realize that this could happen to anybody at any time. And I had a time I'm retired. So talk to people at Innocence Project and join Innocence Project as a volunteer. Sure. I worked in a technology for Illinois State Board of Education for 27 years and then I retired and I had done some work for a, a Head Start program, you know, and the last five years I have been doing volunteering on a different projects. You know, I just wanted to make some difference if, you know, uh, the, the first realization joining this project was that this thing is more common than an individual, you know, common person would realize. And that was eye-opener for me. I just thought this things never happens in our society. And not only it was happening, but it was a lot more than what I thought it was happening in cases. So I just wanted to, you know, I have the time, I have some skills. They needed people in terms of database and computer technology. And I had worked in this area, so I offered my services. And I have been working there for the last three years now. I really don't think to be a volunteer you need to have a legal background. There are so many different tasks that this project needs to get accomplished. So even without a legal background, you could be a great help to this project. I have done many different things with Innocence Project. The, initially, I basically took care of databases, you know, making sure we can enter the data. I have entered the data, made copies, uh, uh, created a statistical report out of those databases for a federal reporting. So many things one can do, you know, they can read cases, they can do Xeroxing it, they can, re, you know, scan the different things. There's so many different tasks one can do. Working with this thing, uh, project, I have gone to the prison visits. So I have seen people in prison that we work for it, and I have been lucky to see some of these people that we see in prisons were later on exonerated. And I think it is a tremendous feeling to, to see a person, his family, relieved of these things. You know, they were wrongfully incarcerated, they have spent 10, 12 years, and many times Innocent Projects is their last hope. I would say that in terms of uh, all my, you know, I have been involved here and there, but this is one of the best things I have ever done. And particularly going and meeting with prisons, meeting with families, seeing how much they suffer with their loved one and incarcerated for, uh, you know, the crime they have not committed. Many times they are at the wrong place at the wrong time. To, I mean, this is the first time I have involved in a project that actually tears comes to your eyes when you see somebody who is walking out of a jail. After 10, 15 years, you in your heart know that he needed to finally system realize that this individual has not committed crime to have him meet his families. It's an unbelievable feeling. I, 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 I mean, I can't describe it. One has to feel it to, to, to see what it is. But I, this is, as I say, I see all my coworkers sometimes, you know, when, when we get somebody out of prison, there are tears in everybody's eyes. Yeah, this is one of the most remarkable experiences of my life. And I, I am so glad that I have been able to do. I think they can do this, you know, if they see somebody who is exonerated, like one of the exonerated that we had, Anthony Murray, and when he came out, one of the local company gave him a laptop computer and put all the software and everything 
for him. So yeah, you could you could teach them technology. You can provide them this technology like a computer, or an iPad, or something. Surprisingly, you know, I talk about this. I'm passionate about it, and I have found this thing so easy. Two things I have seen it is people have no idea that this is happens, and I was that way. So, so when we have a friend, we have a get together. I talk to them, and, and they says they didn't know that. They didn't know that. And I think many of them have financially big contributors to our project because they realize that there is unfairness, there is injustice here, and they would like to help. And some of them have already asked me they would like to volunteer for our project. I think I, I have come to conclusion, first of all, that once individual knows that what this project is all about, getting them committed, Getting resources from them is a very easy part. Many times people just don't know that this happens in society. I think one way is to go to a large group of people whenever you have a chance to meet, like a League of Women Voters. You know, our community. You know, I belong to Indian community. We have get together and we have invited people, and it just opens. Whenever you get a chance to a group of people, I think talk about innocence project. Let people realize that there are people who are in prison right now with no fault of their own and we as a society do owe them something. Only thing I can do is I can say is just get involved in this project no matter what state where you are. It's been written about a certain Illinois lawyer that quote as a young lawyer traveling on horseback from courthouse to courthouse he often felt compelled to handle cases pro bono. The legacy of this lawyer and his commitment to pro bono service hangs over every Illinois lawyer's head. He knew and preached that lawyers needed to serve all people. Lawyers and the public alike owe him a tremendous debt of gratitude for literally uh, raising the bar on what it means to provide access to justice for all. That young lawyer, of course, was Abraham Lincoln our own Abraham Lincoln. We at the Illinois Innocence Project are the first to realize that we could not do the work that we do in terms of serving our clients without the pro bono assistance of outside lawyers. This work is so important for me. I vowed to myself that I would turn right around upon my release and help those like I was helped when I was in a hole and I had my hands up in the air and I was asking for somebody to help me, the Innocence Project reached in that hole and they pulled me out. And so now I'm turning around and I'm putting two hands in that hole because I want to pull more people out. And I'm asking everyone in this room to put both of your hands in that hole and pull somebody out because you'd want the same if it was you, and you'd want the same if it was a family member or a friend of yours. You'd want their help. <sighs> I would like to invite the exonerees here onto stage with me. If you all will give them a round of applause, please. dreams do come true. When at one point dreams were just to have a normal life and to get a good job and to maybe raise a good family, those dreams turned into, I just want to come home. So I want to thank those who have helped bring these beautiful people home. Please, all the staff members of the Illinois Innocence Project, please come to the stage. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs> 
bear with me. God is good. All the time. And I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for this man, Justin Brooks. Please come to the stage, sir. And last, but definitely not the least, we got some young, hungry, excited, and powerful young people that want to that bring people home, that have signed up for the job and the task to do it. Please, students of the Illinois Innocence Project, please come to the stage. As well as the law school. Please come to the stage. family, when at one point we felt like we were by ourselves as we sat in a cell, family, please, if you can, if you're able, with your hard-earned dollars, donate to the Illinois Innocence Project. We need you, our community. It starts with you. You are now aware that we need your help. <laughs> so nobody can play ignorant in here. Okay? So thank you for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being a part of this. Little brother. <laughs> thank you. If you can do anything to help somebody, do it. That's what it's all about. That's, 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 the, that's the key to, uh, to feeling good about yourself if you can help somebody because somebody has helped you along the way. And that's what it's all about. It's not about self. I, I, I've taught this not about how much money you make that makes you rich, but what you can give. <laughs>